Stories passed down from one generation to another. Tales that attempt to explain the unexplainable, to scare the little ones into behaving. Folklore is something special to all of us. Every culture has its own folklore. Thanks to the internet, we can share all of our folklore stories with each other. But a rare, unlucky few of us are able to share true stories of encounters with folklore that might have turned out to be real. These are five allegedly true and terrifying folklore stories. Be sure to leave a like to spread these scary stories far and wide. And don't forget to share your story with us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Walk Walk in the Night from Chingy I grew up in the countryside in the Philippines, where people believe in mythical creatures and other superstitious things. As for me, I grew up not really paying attention to such things, until it happened to me. In 2010, I was a third year in university, when I got pregnant with my first child. University is a five to six hour drive away from home so I only visit home every semester break, Christmas, or the end of every semester. I was almost seven months along when I went home and told my parents about it. It was a mess, but in the end, they ended up being pretty supportive. On the first night I was back, they put a lot of garlic on my bedroom windows. I know why. In our country, there's a creature called Wok Wok. It is a mythical creature that has huge, wide wings, a long tongue, which they use to eat unborn children, and some say they look like fruit bats, and can even transform to a black pig or a dog. It would make this walk walk sound in a slow manner. That's where the name comes from. They scratch on roofs, sticking their tongue through holes until it reaches the victim and drains it of blood. The first night was fine. I slept throughout the night, but things changed after I gave birth. One night, I woke up around 3 a.m., hearing a scratching sound on the roof. I didn't mind it at first, and I tried to go back to sleep, but then I heard that telltale sound, and it horrified me. That walk walk. I was so terrified. All I could do was sit in the corner of my bed and pray. This would happen some nights, and it would always stop at 5 a.m. But after the first time, I asked my younger brother to sleep in my room with me. My story doesn't end there. One night, I was asleep with my newborn child, when I was awakened by dogs howling. But they didn't sound alert. They sounded scared. I've never heard dogs howl like that. This sound was quickly followed by a woman's voice. It seemed to be close, like she was just inside my room. And then it stopped for a moment. Eventually, she began to talk again. I could not really understand what she was saying. This time, the voice seemed so far away from me, I froze for a while and remembered the stories I heard when I was younger. They say that if the voice you hear seems so near, it means the opposite, and when it seems far away, it means it's close by. I gathered myself, grabbed my baby, and I ran towards my parents' room. The moment I entered into my parents' room, the howling stopped, and the peaceful night returned. I contemplated whether or not I should wake my parents up, or try to go back to my room, but I couldn't stop thinking that she was back there still, just waiting for me. This thought terrified me, so I decided to stay and wake my parents up. I told them what had happened, and I stayed in their room with my mom and younger brother. Dad stayed in my room until I went back to university. That moment, 
That night, it will always give me goosebumps, but I'm glad my baby was unharmed. Beware the walk walk. The Bajan Goblin from Carl G. My family is originally from a small yet popular island of Barbados before moving to New York decades ago. Whenever I visited the island as a child with my younger sister, we always had a great time. The warm temperatures, sights, and beautiful beaches always kept us occupied with fun. Now as an adult with my own two young kids, I enjoy seeing their excitement and fun whenever we visit the island. There was a plan between my wife and I that when our children were old enough, we would move into my parents' home there and raise our family. The education system was very good, and it was also much safer living there compared to New York. The house in Barbados was my mother's, and she only used it during the summer and only for a month. It was in the parish of Christ Church, a densely populated part of the island near the capital and a bunch of tourist attractions. Yet, there were still a lot of trees, fields, and plant life. It was common to see rows of buildings and homes on one side of the street, but a lot of bushes and trees on the other side, which would look like a mini jungle. You could see a lot of wild animals there, like turtles, birds, and even monkeys. When the opportunity arose, we were ecstatic to finally be able to move there. I was able to find a good job to support us, and soon enough, my wife got her cake designing business off the ground. As we were settling into our new home, we met our neighbors. Everyone was very friendly and helpful. Our little neighborhood was off a main road, down a quiet road. The houses were all separated by large yards and bush, so there was a bit of privacy from each other too. There was one house next to our own that was abandoned mid-construction. That happened 30 years ago, and it's been vacant ever since, overrun by bushes and vines. I always felt uneasy about that place. Sometimes I felt something was watching me from within. I never let my kids play in the yard over there, without one of us watching close by. As weeks passed, I had brief chats with the neighbors. They would often suggest keeping the door shut when no one was home, and always locking everything down at night. It sounded like the common sense type stuff, to keep monkeys, mosquitoes, and even burglars out. Barbados isn't as bad with crime compared to New York, but everywhere has their criminals. This advice was a given, and wasn't something I really thought over. But what was weird was that every single person we spoke to gave us this advice. I did notice at night, as it grew late, everyone would have their doors and outside gates locked and windows shut tight. Being in that we were in the Caribbean, I could imagine the heat inside those buildings. As for my family, at night we left our windows and curtains open to get as much of the cool evening inside as possible. The breeze was a godsend. Although nothing happened, there were some moments at night when I would wake up and I would catch a glimpse of something in the window. It was a brief shadow of a figure looking inside, but when I would clear my eyes, the figure would be gone. I assumed it was my sleepy eyes playing tricks on me, so I would just go back to sleep. In the following weeks, we were beginning to notice small things missing. An earring here, a small chain there. Even my kids mentioned they couldn't find certain toys. At first, I figured it was due to the chaotic atmosphere of moving into a new home, but I began to think more of the warnings my neighbors gave us. I became more observant of the things around the house, and I became a light sleeper at night. I still wasn't ready to board up my house like a prison like everyone else, I just had to be more vigilant. Then, one night, I woke up to the sound of something running across the roof. It was a metal roof, and I heard the clicking and clanging of something with sufficient weight up there. 
I got out of bed and I tried to follow the footsteps over my head. It couldn't be a bird or even a monkey. These footsteps were far too heavy. I followed the sound to my kids' room. Their window was open, but there were still bars over them for security. Then I remembered what my neighbors kept telling me about keeping them closed at night. As I looked at my children, who were fast asleep, I saw something jump down from the roof in the nearby window. I crept over to the window and looked out, catching a glimpse of something running around the corner of the house. I told my wife to get the kids and to take them to our bedroom. I locked the door and I called the police. I grabbed my gun and I went outside. I crept around the corner, making my way towards the kids' window, where that thing had jumped down. I could hear something like flat feet slapping the pavement ahead of me, as if something was running around. When I turned that corner, I saw it. This creature was up on my kid's window, with its arm feeling around inside, searching for something. It was humanoid in shape, with pale white skin, big eyes, a wide mouth that hardly contained its many sharp teeth, and it was nude, although I couldn't see any genitals. It also had long white hair that ran down its back. I noticed it had inhumanly long fingers and long feet. It wasn't very tall at all, as it was mostly hunched over. At most, it was four and a half feet tall. The closest thing I could compare it to would be Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but with a lot of white hair on its head that ran down midway towards its back. It then noticed me looking at it, and after a few moments, it ran off around the corner of the house. Part of me wanted to run back inside and hide with my family until the police arrived, but there was something else that urged me to follow it, to find out what the hell this thing was. It could be a threat to my family, and I would not be able to rest easy at night, knowing this thing was running around outside my kid's window, reaching in through the dark. So I gripped my gun, and I followed it. I could hear its feet flapping up the stairs to the roof deck. I followed it up. As I was looking around, I began to have second thoughts. If I cornered this creature, things could get dangerous. But it was too late. It was coming over the ridge of the roof, right towards me. It was hissing and showing its teeth. I aimed my gun at it as I was slowly backing away from it. I was terrified. Everything that was my motivation to chase this thing seemingly vanished. The creature was going to attack me, and I wasn't sure if I was capable of defending myself, not when I was this scared. It charged me, and I fell back as I fired the gun in fright. I have no idea if I hit it, but it hissed and made a hard right turn, making a 20-foot leap towards a mango tree that was next to the house. As I picked myself up from the ground, I could hear something fall from the tree and land into the bush. At that moment, the police arrived and they heard the gunshot. I told them that it was some intruder. I had shot at him to chase him away, and he jumped into the bush in the abandoned house's yard. It was the only time that night that I thought with a clear head. I knew the cops would not believe that I just chased away a boogeyman. As the police scoured the area, my neighbors came out due to the excitement and the sound of the gunshot. Many of them were carrying bats or frying pans and other handheld makeshift weapons to help. I told them the story of the human intruder to keep things consistent and for anyone to not doubt my sanity. After a few minutes, the police came back, saying that they saw a path the intruder may have taken towards the abandoned house. Although they found no one in the house, they found a lot of random belongings of people in the neighborhood, even myself. It then dawned on me that this thing was in my house at some point, and I got a cold shudder down my back.
A few days later, there was nothing new from the police to report. I paid someone to chop down all the bushes from the abandoned house property so that nothing or anyone could hide in it. The abandoned house itself had no doors, nothing covering the windows, since it had been abandoned mid-construction. I took some time to do some research on the internet. I needed to find something that resembled what I saw. I needed an explanation. Surprisingly, there was nothing in Barbados that came close, although I did find stories of creatures in Europe, specifically of mischievous goblins. There were countless stories of goblins that stole jewelry, money, and personal belongings from people's homes. They were usually not dangerous, but mischievous. Until you got in their way, then they would become a threat. They could become vindictive, vicious, dangerous. For a while, I wondered how did this thing get here from Europe. Then I realized Barbados was a British colony in the past, and at some point, it or its ancestors may have come along the ships back then. It and its ilk could have been here for centuries, but was able to keep out of the public eye, staying alive in the shadows. We never found its body, and I haven't seen any sign of that thing since that night. But I can't shake the feeling that it's still out there. We now have central air conditioning for the house, so it's much easier to keep all the windows and doors shut throughout the night and day. I just wondered if I made a mistake going out after it that night, of injuring it. I pray that it's dead or scared off permanently, because I don't want it to come back after my family for revenge. It's only a matter of when. My Family's Banshee from Giaccio Frame When we were younger, my older sister would always speak of this old lady who cried and screamed whenever she came to visit her. And apparently after every visit, someone close to us in our family would die. Throughout her life, up until just this weekend, she was convinced that the woman she had been seeing was some sort of evil person or entity, someone to blame for the deaths of her loved ones. In an attempt to get rid of her, my sister did all she could with sage and other cleansing rituals. But then something horrifying happened. My brother-in-law had done some major permanent damage to his ankle while doing his drywall installation job somewhere in the city or nearly outside of it. That's when the old lady came back to see my sister, wailing as before. She was weeping hysterically as always, giving my sister a cause for concern. She kept a close eye on her injured family member. It may have just been a broken angle, but anything could go wrong. As soon as he was feeling better, the weeping woman did not return for a long time once again. Now, considering my family has Celtic background, my older sister believes that what she was experiencing, this screaming old lady, it must have been a banshee. The spirit isn't meant to be feared. They're said to be indicators that someone is hurt, sick, dying, or has already passed. They're in no way harmful, but more helpful in the sense that they stick around forever, warning you of anyone close to their deathbed. That explains why my sister could never get rid of her, no matter what she did. She was simply trying to help, even if the screaming was agonizingly scary. The Fairy in the Woods, from Cam Bay. I loved the woods, at least I used to. I live in a more closed-in community where the tale of fairies are well known. My nan always told me that if I went into the woods alone, I could be taken by the so-called fairies or fey folk. But me and my cousin, let's call him Mike, well, we never believed in the old tales of fairies and always thought our nan was crazy. But I now know how wrong we were. 
At the age of 13, we decided to go into the woods, building a fort in the trees, normal kid things around my area. But Nan made sure to tell us to go together and to never separate. We decided to forget her warning, crazy old Nan, but we soon regretted that decision. Mike was holding a bag with all of our gear in it, including a bottle of water. As Mike was getting the tarp to cover the branches, he asked me to go to the pond and get more water. Now, of course, I always thought my Nan was crazy, but something about walking that path made me feel uneasy. So I asked if he could go, and I made up an excuse about my leg hurting or cramping. Mike rolled his eyes. I doubt he believed me. But without a rebuttal, he left. I started to throw the tarp over the tree branches, but then I, I felt it, a cold, sharp breath down my neck. I immediately flung around, but no one was there. So I told myself it was just a gust of wind. I continued with what I was doing, but now there was a bit of a chill in the back of my mind. It was getting dark soon, and Mike never came back, so I was getting worried. I grabbed my flashlight and began to head down the path. But the further I went, the darker it got, and the dread I felt became stronger. I was afraid to continue, but I forced myself to, because I had to find Mike. Eventually, I made it to the pond, but I never saw my cousin anywhere. I called his name over and over. I was scared he may have gone home without me, abandoning me in what was now the dark woods. I ended up giving up, turning to walk home, but I saw someone in the trees. They were close, and I shone my light on them to see if it was Mike, and I honestly thought it was him. He was in the tree, smiling and waving down at me, so, with a nervous smile, I waved back. He then proceeded to motion for me to come closer, so I listened and began to walk over. But just like that, I froze. I saw the eyes on Mike. They were white and reflective. I then recalled how my nan told me that fairies can take the forms of people. People you know, people you love, and the only way you can really tell the difference is their pupils. I slowly walked backwards, but as I did so, the imposter Mike slowly frowned and charged at me full force after jumping down from the tree. I managed to grab the bag off the ground, running home as fast as I could, but just as I saw the house, something jumped on me. I managed to kick it off. It was that Mike thing so it made sense that I could push him off easily, as Mike was much smaller than me. As I got back up and ran, I got to the step where my uncle was having a smoke. He saw me being chased and immediately grabbed his pocket knife. He pulled me behind him, but as soon as he did, that fake Mike cut into him with its nails. My uncle let out a curse and punched at it, causing it to run away with an eerie smile. My now bleeding uncle carried himself along with me to the front door to reveal my nan and cousin crying at the table. My nan immediately ran and hugged me, and my cousin did the same. They both had been worried because Mike said he had been chased by someone who looked like me. My cousin went home that night, and I slept with my nan. From then on, I was afraid to go in the woods, and I always listen to my nan when she talks about fairies. Thai Love Potion from J. Eon My grandmother was born and raised in a rural village in the south of Thailand. She lived with her grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, who was the village witch doctor and healer. 
Suffice to say, she has a plethora of stories about charms, spells, objects, and possessions to tell whenever the chance arises. However, there is a story that she told me as a cautionary tale for all the girls in the family. It was a very frightening tale for a tween girl, as I was at the time when I heard it, which was when I had a newfound curiosity towards romance with boys that my peers were, of course, simultaneously experiencing. The story she told goes like this. In her village, there was a man who was poor and very ugly. He was unmarried, despite being nearly 40 years old, a very old age to still be a bachelor at the time. Otherwise, nothing about him was outstanding or memorable. He was just like any other unassuming average guy in the village. Just a few yards away lived a family with a very beautiful teenage daughter. It was very popular, and there was an unending stream of proposals from within the village and elsewhere to marry the gorgeous girl. The poor, ugly man, having seen the girl grow up and blossom into this attractive, sought-after damsel, proposed to her family to marry her. And, unsurprisingly, he was rejected by the girl, and even had the door shut in his face by the rest of her family. Most people in the village and the girl's family were quite certain that she would select the creme de la creme of her suitors to marry most likely a young, handsome, successful scion of an affluent family. No one thought much of the rejected man, as there were many other people whose proposals had been turned away. One week later, the girl disappeared. Her family and some villagers went searching for her, when they realized that the man nearby had went missing too. After several days of searching, they collectively concluded that the girl had run away with the man, when no one was out and about. They assumed that the girl did in fact love the man, despite her initial rejection, choosing to start a new life with him far away from the judgment of the villagers, due to the disparity in their age and appearance, and the man's poverty. A decade passed and life was the usual in the village. There was none of the lingering social anxiety that we're used to today when someone goes missing because it was not unheard of for girls to run away from home to escape arranged marriages, or secret lovers eloping, or married mothers abandoning their unhappy homes. One day the girl suddenly reappeared at the entrance of her family home. Everyone was surprised at her return, and questioned her about the events leading up to the day of her vanishing. It had been ten years at that point, she explained that she suddenly fell madly in love with the poor ugly man while out in the evening, and at the man's behest, agreed to run away with him in the middle of the night to another village very far away so that no one could find them. She bore him two children and lived the typical domestic housewife life for the most part of the past decade, looking after her children and taking care of her husband. She never questioned the things that were happening, and had no control over her actions. It was as if she had been living in a constant, trance-like state for a decade. The morning of her return, she woke up feeling extremely disgusted by her husband and had lost all interest in her children. She wanted to return to her family badly, and did just that, leaving her husband and children asleep, not even telling them that she would be gone. Her family found her story very fishy, so they took her to see my great-great-grandfather, who very quickly deduced that a love potion was involved. A Thai love potion is an oil-like substance that is made from the little pockets of fats around the chin and jawline of deceased people. The oil is collected by burning a deceased person's mandible with a special candle until liquids appear, which are then collected in vials and a particular spell is placed on the fluids by a black magic witch doctor. Even though these are called love potions, they are in fact inducement of extreme obedience in liquid form. The targets of these love potions lose all free will, emotion, and awareness. They are used not just for romantic targets, but have been used by criminals, causing victims to hand over all their money and jewels, among other things. Despite the love potion's power, it does not have a permanent impact on its targets, 
depending on the concentration of the potion and the competence of the black magic witch doctor. The effects can last anywhere from a few hours to a few years. A person under the influence of a love potion will regain all physical and mental control of themselves once the effect wears off. Hence, the love potion needs to be continually applied to the target to ensure constant sway over his or her life. Even though she was no longer a teenager, she was still very beautiful and recognizable, so many sympathized with her experience. That is why when her husband of 10 years, the poor and ugly former neighbor of the girl's family, showed up to try to bring her home. There was a huge uproar from the girl's family and the villagers. They chased him out when he started begging to see her. He returned to the village with his two children in tow, thinking that the sight of her children would soften her heart, but she remained adamant, refusing to leave her family home no matter how much her children begged to see their mother. She felt no connection to those children at all, even if they were her flesh and blood, and she definitely did not have any loving memory of the marriage and the family life she had had. Since she refused to leave her family's house, she did not allow the man and the two children inside, so there was no way to apply a love potion to her again to make her conform to his wishes. In addition to that, my great-great-grandfather, the white magic witch doctor, gave her a protective charm and an anti-love potion, which he instructed her family to scatter in the general vicinity of the house so that no other mind-controlled magic would affect her or anyone in the household. He gave the girl a special blessing that grants protection from spiritual attacks and removed any black magic residue. The man came back to the village regularly, trying to convince her to return to him and their children, but she never once gave him any attention. Two years after her return, she married a man of her liking with the blessings of her parents. She lived with her new husband for the rest of her life and bore many children with him, never once acknowledging her previous husband and the two children from that marriage. It was like the ten years she experienced with this man never happened. It was all like a dream, my grandmother would say, concluding the story with that. She'd always tell this story whenever my female cousins express romantic interests in boys or someone we know is getting married. She claims that she wants to make sure that it was real love and not the result of some mind control magic. Real love, from what she taught me, is rational and deliberate. No one becomes completely different overnight for love and it lasts for a long time. So it can't just disappear within a day. Hmm, maybe I should concoct a subscriber potion, something to get folks to click that button and the notification bell. W wait a minute, maybe YouTube gave me a potion a few years ago to become their video slave. Oh well, I like it. I'll do anything for a scary story. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and click the dang notification bell too. Share your story with us at darkstories.org, and be sure to check out my Patreon and merch store with the links in the description. Now as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode, about four backpacking horror stories. Scipion Anderson says, First, hey darkness, been watching your videos for months and you're on fire. Saves me time from working. Your videos always give me energy to push through work and always have me looking over my shoulder. Have a good one. Thanks, Asipion. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's a really cool feeling to know that I can help people through the day, as when I used to work detailing cars, I would always listen to a podcast, usually the Drabblecast or the No Sleep Podcast. But now I can provide people with stories myself, and I'm so glad I got a following. Farmland USA says, instantly clicks video after falling backwards. Maybe I should have a warning at the start of my episodes. Darkness prevails is bad for your balance. Find me in the mountains says, I bring my girlfriend camping because I know I'm faster than her. That's evil, but smart. Evil smart. James Fish says, Skinwalker Hitman for hire. Call 555-Skinwalker. 
James, my man, I think that's too many numbers. But if I do manage to contact him, I've got a few hits I need. Because a certain McDonald's employee gave me one too few nuggets. And Jeremy Merriman says, The Bunny Hood Watches. So now that I have two rabbits of my own, am I part of the bunny hood? Because it sounds like a good time. A little creepy, but a good time. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are on the way. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're awesome people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.